Do you ever hold up the game looking for that perfect dungeon tile or tell your players one second and then take 10, 15 minutes to set up the next room in the dungeon? Battle mats and posters are a little faster, but then it just looks like you're playing with plastic toys on a low res JPEG. In my search for my perfect solution, I stumbled across DM Scotty's 2.5D next system that's a bit of a mouthful but it was pretty clever what he did is he took eva foam pads and stamped texture on them with stamps made from foam core it was an interesting solution but it wasn't quite there for me he needed to take one more step and it would have been perfect so if we look at a piece of foam core it takes texture very well the only problem is is it damages super easy as you can see here it doesn't really hold up it creases if it's bent. A lot of times when you make things using foam core or other polystyrene, it doesn't last very long. If we look at EVA foam now, it's very durable. It'll take a beating. If you play on this, you're not gonna get dents and dings on it too easy. And it's incredibly flexible. Doesn't really stay creased permanently. It's a really good product if you're not looking to texture it. The problem with texturing EVA foam is you need heat. The problem with heating up foam is if it's not done in a controlled way, you can release a lot of toxic fumes that you don't want to be breathing in. Hot wire cutters don't generally bring your foam to a point where it's going to combust, so they're a little safer to use, but when you're using balled up aluminum foil and a heat gun, well, you're not really controlling that temperature at all. When I make my builds, I try to keep these things in mind because it's not just me that lives here. There are other people, I have pets. I don't want to do anything that's ruining the air that we're breathing in. After some experimenting, I finally stumbled across something that works pretty good. If we combine the EVA with the foam core, we get something that's more flexible and takes texture very well. And the result is something like this. Because I've layered the two types of foam, I have the foam core where I put my texture on and then it's backed with EVA foam to give it the durability. This was my first attempt at it and it's survived being thrown around my car, a couple different tables and just throwing random stuff on it. I think at one point I was rolling dice on this. So putting these two foams together results in a very durable system. And another benefit to this is you can make walls, you can stack up paper or other dungeon tiles on there to outline walls, or you can keep it blank and just have your minis on there and it still gives the sense of the space that you're in. Another thing that you could do is if you coated it in dry erase coating, you could dry erase your own walls onto it as you go. As you can see, it's a pretty versatile solution that speeds up gameplay at the table. Why don't we go over to the other footage where I show you how to make one. To start out, I'm gonna check to see which side of the foam core the paper is going to peel easiest from. And that's gonna be the side we're gonna use for our texturing. So we're gonna keep the paper on that side for now. So I'm gonna turn it around to where the paper's uh, a little harder to remove and we're gonna peel that first. And this is gonna get glued right onto the EVA foam. Usually when I do this, I'll glue down my EVA foam sheets to a full sheet of foam core. And then I'll cut the foam core with my guillotine cutter. It makes it so you get cleaner lines. But for the sake of this tutorial, I've pre-cut this um, and you can do the same or you can glue them both and then cut them out after. You can see here where the paper's been so damaged, when I'm peeling this off, a lot's staying behind, and that's just because the it's taken quite a few hits and it's had pressure laid down on it, so this paper's just being reluctant. You should try to get off as much as you can, but the ultimate goal here is just to make as porous of a surface as you can, have more foam showing than paper, now to glue this, I'm gonna go around the perimeter with a bead of glue, and then I'm gonna make an X. That way I know I am getting adhesive in most of the points of contact between the EVA and the foam core. You don't have to do a full coat on this. You just wanna make sure that you have the glue spaced out enough so that you don't have any pockets of air that can cause the foam to separate. As you're going around and spreading the glue, rather than pulling it in towards the center, pull it out towards the edges and that's just going to make sure that you have good adhesion all around the perimeter of this. You can see that rather than 
using a brush to spread the glue out. I'm using this silicone, I think it's a makeup applicator. It's a lot harder to clean the glue from a brush than it is from silicone. Once the glue hardens, it pulls right off. And now I'm going to bond the two pieces of foam together, spread it out, get any air pockets from underneath, try to straighten out the foam as much as you can. There's quite a bit of damage on this piece of foam core. I'll show you a way to remove any type of dents or bumps. Once I feel like I've got it flattened out pretty well, I'm just gonna put some weight on here. Nothing too official. We just want to make sure that one, as it's drying, the foam doesn't warp and two, it's gonna have contact between the two pieces of foam. So we can go ahead and flip this around once the glue is dried, pull off the other side of the paper. As you can see, this side is coming off much more easily. Once we have it all off, there might be a little bit of cleanup. I'm pulling off some of the left behind paper that kind of got caught in the grooves more. This has taken a couple dings. You don't have to be too ginger in this process because you're gonna be texturing this side anyway. If you get some tears or anything like that, it's not a big deal. We just wanna make sure the paper is gone from this side because it will stick out once we texture and paint this. Here I'm gonna use a chunk of granite that I found. It broke off of a curb and there's just a lot of surfaces that have some really good texture. You don't have to use granite. You could use balled up aluminum or anything like that. What I like about this is I don't have to worry about the foil compressing so much that it's not giving me good texture. This is hard enough where I don't have to worry about it flattening out too much on me. You really could use anything that is hard and has a good level of detail in the texture. Just something to give it a more natural look. If you go too large with the details, what could happening is it might look life-size instead of to scale. As I'm going around, I'll be using the different sides of it and different edges and different protrusions just to get different types of ruts and divots in the foam core. This will help me emulate places where erosion may have occurred or where the rock has fractured. This is just gonna vary the texture so you don't have something that looks too uniform. For this part of it, you can add as much texture as you want. You can go highly detailed or you can just go around and make some texture here and there just to vary it. It's really all dependent on what look you're going for and what type of rock you're trying to recreate. For this, I'm gonna go with a little less detail than the first one I made, which is the brown one you see in the intro of this video. I'll discuss how I get that different look later on in the tutorial. We've got good texture across the foam core, so we'll go ahead and get this sealed now. I'm using Mod Podge mats here for the sealant. I'm not using particularly great brushes for the Mod Podge, and that's because it's going to do a number on it. I would certainly recommend not using your favorite brush for this portion of it. Be random in your brush strokes. You want to get some texture from this process. Any added texture at this point that you can get is gonna help you out here. And pick out any chunks or dog fur that might be in there. We're going to get this saturated into the foam uh, so that way it hardens up pretty good for us. You could mix this with black paint. There's a lot of other YouTubers that suggest this. Mixing black paint in there would speed this up because you're gonna be able to knock out both this process and the next process all in one shot. We wanna make sure we get the edges covered with this because one, this will become a wick if you have it sealed on one side and then you have the EVA foam on the other. Any moisture that might get around this is just gonna suck right into the edges of this. It'll also help further bond the two pieces of foam together. You 
can see what I mentioned earlier about the dent in the foam. While it's wet, I'm going to bend it in the opposite direction of the dent. And this will just help that dent come out. It may not be 100% at first, but once you go through the next few phases, everything gets wet and dry, wet and dry. It should straighten it out. If not, it's just some added texture that you don't have to work for. You can see all the textures that I've gotten this piece from the, the variation of the brush strokes and the texture from the granite. Once that's dry, we'll go ahead and coat the bottom or the EVA foam side of this with the Mod Podge. Don't worry too much about this side. Just make sure there's no big chunks or anything like that. This is gonna be the side that has contact with the table. So as long as you don't have anything that's gonna create a bump from underneath, it's fine. This is more about protection than anything else. So we're not really too worried about the aesthetic here. See where the top dripped down to the bottom? This is the type of thing I mentioned. You don't wanna have any chunks that are too big and might cause it to lift from the table and throw the, the look of the whole thing. So just knock out anything like that and then just reseal that spot and it should be good to go. While that's drying, we can go ahead and put together anything that we might be using later on in this process. You can watch me fail at an experiment. My thought was to use some cheap pastels I bought at some discount store as a way of adding texture, almost like using grit or other types of texturing paste. I figured this, if it broke off or anything like that, it would leave some interesting color behind. For the most part, I'm using muted colors or at the very least colors that you'd find in nature. The problem with these is these pastels, these are probably the hardest pastels I've ever handled before. Rather than pastel-like or even chalk-like, like they're more like bricks. Using the knife didn't really work out so well. There was probably more danger in that than I should have gambled with. Fortunately, I put it in the bag when I did this and I didn't make that mistake, but I decided to try and crush it with my pliers. The next couple went smooth until I got to the yellow. That didn't work very well. So I'd smash it with a hammer and that is a thwack if anyone's wondering, but the hammer did not do as well as, as I thought it would. It did crush it, but it left big chunks uh, and I had to add another bag. Once I was done with this process, I put it into a spice jar and I ended up putting the bag in, shaking it out and then cutting it and then emptying the contents into the spice jar. Something I did off camera was I added some rocks to this so I could shake them up and it would crush up a little bit better. To be honest, if you skip this part of it entirely, probably be much easier for you. The added texture is not worth the headache. And now we will make our color washes for this. To make a wash, what you need is you need your pigment. In this case, I'm using inks and I'm using inks because they're very transparent and they're easy to mix. The surfactant, I am using uh, dollar store bubbles, the kind that you get in the big bottles. The mixture is going to be one part bubbles, two parts water. And when we add our pigment or the ink, if you use the type of dropper bottles I have here, we're gonna use an entire dropper full. We're using spray bottles. That's because of the technique I'm gonna be using. The key here is not the specific colors that I'm using for the inks. The key here is using vibrant colors, more vibrant than what you want your end product to be. And that's because these are gonna be muted quite a bit by the end of this. I did three colors, you could do more, but you're definitely gonna wanna do at least a couple different colors. If you look at stone in the real world, there's a lot of variation. 
once you fill the bottles, you wanna give them a good shake. You could use an agitator if you want, but these are thin enough where rigorous shake should mix it up enough for you. If you're enjoying this video and you find it helpful at all, please hit the like button and leave me a comment below. We're going to paint this with black paint. This is going to do a couple things for us. First, it's going to act like a primer on top of that Mod Podge. Even though it is matte Mod Podge, it's in reality, the finish is more like a satin finish. Paint doesn't stick as well to it. This is gonna help our paint stick a little better. And the other thing it's gonna help us with is it's gonna darken up all of the recesses without us having to paint that in. And if any of the preceding layers chip or take any damage, the black will just give us something to hide that. You'll notice too that I'm using a round brush and that's just because it makes it easier with the round brush to paint in any deep crevices or any of the texture that I painted on. If you're using a flat brush here, it would be hard to get into some of these spots. The bottom of this, don't worry too much about making this look great. We're just trying to hide the white so it doesn't stick out when it's on the table. And now that the bottom has dried, let's flip it around. You can see I'm actually using the mat as a palette. And I do this just because it's easier and I don't have to keep filling a well palette to paint this. Because it's so large, it also helps spread it out a lot easier because I'm not constantly dipping into a palette. I'm just spreading the paint that I'm adding to the mat. And I'm going to paint the edges first. Painting the edges first is gonna allow you to see anything that you've missed when you start painting the rest of it uh, because the edges will dry. Then you can go back and hit any spots that you didn't get. Now, it is important that you fill any areas that have big gaps or make sure you don't have any sections that are transparent and make sure that there's no white foam shining through because that's going to stick out quite a bit here. The other thing too, is you wanna make sure you don't have any big globs. I know that's somewhat contradictory considering we're using the mats for our palette, but just keep spreading that paint out until you don't have any buildup of paint anywhere. <clears throat> something somewhat therapeutic about watching this white foam get painted black. Don't worry too much if your paint is streaky. We're not too worried about that, especially because we still have quite a bit to paint here, so a lot more is going to get covered, particularly when we do our washes on this. And here, you can see we're just spreading out the rest of the paint. You do wanna make sure that you don't have anything that starts to skin over because that can cause some unwanted texture on there. It'll stick out quite a bit because it'll be smooth in comparison to the rest of the texture on this mat.
now that it's covered, I'm just going around making sure that uh, I fill in any little spots where white is still showing through and I'm making sure that there's no major buildup on the mat. Um, For the base coat, you're gonna wanna pick a color that is close to gray, but has some hue in it. For instance, here I'm using, I believe it's called beach glass, which is like a gray green color. The hue is gonna give it a more natural look. If you go in and again, if you go into nature and you look at the variation in stone, you're not generally gonna see like a flat gray color. You're gonna see green grays, blue grays, red grays, okra grays, you know, there'll be a lot of different colors and that's just the nature of stone. For mixing the paint, you're gonna wanna use one part paint, one part water. As you're painting the base coat, let it be as streaky as it comes out because the streaks are gonna come across as rock striations. So it's actually gonna help sell the look of the stone much more. This is a bit different than a lot of the other solutions out there, and I'm not really sure what to call it because it's not really a battle mat. It's not really a dungeon tile. So if you have any ideas on what I should call this, please leave them in the comments below. Naturally, the footage of me applying the wash didn't record. So here is a dramatic reenactment. Okay, enough of that silly. I'm going to demonstrate how I applied the wash. I'm just spraying the wash directly on the foam. And I'm not taking too much care as to where it lands. The spray pattern is going to help with more natural variation in the color. I'm also going to just let it pull up, not worrying too much about there being too much on here. We want it to pull up because it's going to start blending together and create uh, some interesting patterns on the foam. If you look at my end result of the wash, there is a lot of pooling and streaking and it's all running in and you have these nice bubbles all over the place. If you were doing a miniature like this, you would probably have a lot of problems, but we actually want some of the coffee staining and stuff like that. Because there is so much wash on here, we can't let this dry naturally. It would just take too long. So we're gonna go ahead and use a hairdryer here. With the hairdryer, do not put this too close to the foam. You do not want to lose your texture. You also don't want to take any chances of causing any type of combustion on the foam. We keep the hairdryer far away and have it on the lowest setting. I'm going to dab off any remaining pools so we don't get too much concentration of a single color. Let's go ahead and dry brush. The brush I'm going to use here is a chip brush. And what's nice about this is it's very dry and it has a hay-like texture to it. It gives us a very dusty look. You're not going to use the tip of the brush. So I'll demonstrate the best way to dry brush. We're going to get the pigment deep in the bristles, but we're going to get all of the medium out of the brush. And then what we want to do is add an angle, almost like a soft scrub on our foam. You want to be careful not to put too much pressure down because if you watch here and demonstrate what happens, we've created a big crease. So try not to put too much pressure as you're doing this. The lighter you are, the more easily you can build it up and blend it. I'm using a black coat to dry brush over to demonstrate what happens in the dry brushing process. As you can see, the pigment is coming off on anything that protrudes out and it's keeping most of the paint out of the deeper sections. It's going to create depth for us, especially when we do our final wash. If you look at the black paint on the brush here, you can see that it's important to make sure your base coat or whatever you're dry brushing over is dry before you start dry brushing. You'll see that the paint doesn't show up as easily on this, but that's because the color I'm using is much closer to the colors on this than it is to the black in the demonstration. Don't worry too much if you have a section where you're getting streaky paint. It's all right, just blend it out. Just keep dry brushing and it should smooth all of that out. Make sure you're hitting all the areas. You don't want it to be perfectly even because if it is, it's going to look too manufactured. But you want to make sure you are covering and hitting every spot with at least a little bit of that dry brush paint. 
as you're going through, you also want to make sure that you're getting all your edges. You want to make sure that anywhere your hands were, you're going to hit those spots as well because you don't want to have this big blank spot in the shape of your hand. Now on to our final wash. For this, it's gonna be the same mixture of water to surfactant, again, bubbles. So it's gonna be one part bubbles to two parts water. And I'm putting much more ink in this wash. Uh, it's because I want it to have much more of an impact on the color of the mat. I'm going more for a bluish gray stone. I'm using three droppers full of the Payne's Gray to two droppers full of the sepia. That's gonna give me more of that blue gray that I'm looking for. If you wanted a result closer to the other mat that I show in the video, the brownstone, then you would want to go more sepia than the Payne's gray. When you put the wash on, we're just going to get some good even coverage across the whole thing. Don't worry about anything pulling up because anything like that is just gonna create variation, it's gonna create randomness. And you'll notice there that in the spot where I saw that the wash was a little thin, I added some more then blended it out. You're gonna wanna let this dry completely and naturally before we seal it. If you are going to use the pastels to add additional texture, the ideal time to do that would be in this final wash. We're not doing any other steps that would hold these off and the wash will seep into the pastels, giving it a variation in the color and making it look like it's one with the rest of the mat. Once everything is dry, we can go ahead and put our final seal coat on. We went ahead and just dumped a bunch of Mod Podge onto the mats and we are using the same mats Mod Podge. What we wanna do here is we just wanna spread it out, make sure we're getting a good even coat. One thing that we wanna make sure of is that we are not creating any additional texture. So this is gonna be a little bit more control than the first time we sealed. As I spread it, I'm going to work any of those streaks out and try to remove any texture in there. The best way to go about it is to use crisscross strokes. With something this large, the crisscross strokes, they're not gonna create much of a pattern. It's similar to the way that you would varnish a canvas. Go ahead and pull any chunks or hair or anything like that out now so they're not in there in the final product. And once it's dry, you have a finished product. You should have a decent hard shell on it. If you did add any of the texture, that should be sealed on there now. Overall, I'm pretty happy with the way that these come out. Whether you put scatter train on them or just leave them bare, they have a really nice look to them. And once you have miniatures on there, it all comes together. It gives you a great immersive experience. And they even make some poor attempts at making foam tiles look better. These take about an hour of actual work to make, but when you factor in drying time, it's about a half a day to a day. You can get two of these from a single sheet of foam core. So what I'd recommend is making a couple of them at the same time, and that'll just speed up the process if you wanna make a bunch of them. Now, moving forward, I'll probably make some videos on how to do different styles. We'll do some different types of stone tile. I even wanna do some that are grassland and forest themed. I'm also making some walls for these. So once I have that process, that's completely ironed out. I'll make a video on those as well. Thank you for spending your time with me. Keep an eye out for more videos to come and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.